Before we jump into John chapter 8, I want to show you a picture of an iceberg just to kind of help us all get on the same page about what Jesus does in this passage of Scripture. We're probably all familiar with the phrase, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And we know that that refers to an issue or uh, a problem that, or a person. You can, you can just kind of see a little bit, but the, 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 the whole picture is much bigger. And photographers have been able to use some really impressive equipment to show us not only the top of the iceberg, but all of it. And see that what we can see above the surface is so small in comparison to what's below the surface. And that's true about people, isn't it? That we might know someone, that we might see how they look or the expression on their face, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in their heart and life. And some of us, we're a little bit more discerning. We have a little bit better idea. We're a little bit better at seeing what's going on underneath the surface. But even then, we're not able to see the whole picture. For me as a pastor, there are times that people come and they they share things with me that they wouldn't share with other people. And so I have a little bit deeper look into what's going on in their heart and life. But on the other hand, there are people that as soon as they find out I'm a pastor... They go the exact opposite direction, and they they try to shape up the the top of the iceberg as much as they possibly can to make it look as good as they possibly can. And it may be that you're here today, and all we can see about what's going on in your life is just the tip of the iceberg. It may be that you're here today, and the way you portray yourself, and the way that you express yourself, and the way that you have kind of dolled yourself up to be in church with us today is really hiding what's going on underneath the surface. And I want you to know that while I might not be able to see it, and you might be able to do a great job of of hiding that underneath the surface from me or from people around you or maybe even your friends, your family, your spouse, that Jesus sees all of that. That when he looks at us, he can see down to the deepest recesses of our hearts, that he knows everything about us. And in this passage of Scripture, we see that Jesus is speaking to a crowd that on the face of things, on on the outside looking in, it kind of seems like they're followers, but Jesus knows their hearts. He knows what's going on with them. After all, last week we looked at the beginning of John chapter 8, and Jesus tells us that he does not judge according to the flesh. He does not judge on the outside, but rather he judges what's on the inside, those things that really matter, what is really important. Jesus can see that, and he makes his determinations based on that. And so what we're going to see happen in the second half of John chapter 8 is Jesus speak directly to some needs that are deep down in the bottom, the basement of their hearts. So look with me at John chapter 8 and verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him. So Jesus is saying these things we looked at last week, and people are believing. But then Jesus speaks to those Jews who believe, and he says, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So Jesus speaks to a group of people who are coming to belief in him. They're hearing what he has to say, which was an offense to some, and they're still listening. And on the face of it, it looks like it. These, these are Jesus' disciples. But Jesus says the true test will be if you continue in my word, then you will be my disciples indeed in truth, in full. Now, there's a really important distinction that I need to make here, so track with me, okay? Jesus knows about us what others don't know about us. And Jesus often knows about us maybe sometimes what we don't even know about us. We've probably all had those moments where we say, why do I do this? Or why am I this way? Why am I so upset about this? Have you had a moment like that? Where, where you don't even really know what's going on with you, but Jesus does. And in this moment, Jesus is not only going to call out something that others didn't know about this group. 
He's going to call out something that they didn't even know about themselves. And that was that they were only believing Jesus insofar as he did not mess with their pet sins or their favorite causes. And Jesus says, the real test if you're my follower is if you'll continue with me, you'll abide in my word. Because Jesus knows that there's coming a moment where he's going to say some things that they don't want to hear. And in that moment, they're going to choose it over Jesus. Now, when Jesus says this, he he gives us this verification process. He gives us, this is how you can know that you are truly my disciples, if you continue in my word. And it's really important that we get the order here right. Because Jesus doesn't say, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. Rather, what Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you truly are my disciples. You see, it isn't that continuing in Jesus' word makes them disciples. It isn't that continuing in his word and obeying all the rules makes them followers of Jesus. But rather, if they will continue in his word, it'll be a verification that they are following him. He's saying if you continue in my word, you have true faith. Or if you have true faith, you'll continue in my word. And if we're not careful, we'll think that well, if we obey all of the rules, then we'll be a Christian. If we obey all the commands, then we'll be a follower. And it isn't in that order at all. Rather, it's if we follow Jesus, if we trust in Him, if we put our faith in Him, then we will obey the rules. Then we will follow His commands. Then we will abide in His Word. We can't get the cart before the horse. Do you see that distinction? Jesus is saying, if you follow me, this will come after. It is not that follow, it's not that obeying makes you a follower, but if you're a follower, then you will obey. And he says, abiding in the word of God is the mark of a disciple. But the making of a disciple is in faith. It's in believing. We become followers of Jesus through faith through faith. And then that faith leads to obedience. You see, we believe in instant justification and gradual sanctification. And that means that when we come to Jesus, that we are immediately forgiven of our sins, we're in right standing before God, and that he begins this process of making us more and more like him. And that's the reason that we often say that baptism is not a finish line, but it's a starting line. Baptism says, I put my faith in Jesus, and He is doing this work in me. And in the years to come, He's going to constantly be working me over, constantly bringing up this sin that's in my life, constantly bringing up this brokenness so that He can fix it. And there's going to constantly be these areas of my life that Jesus wants to move into and take dominion over. He's going to come into and make and rearrange to look more and more like his kingdom. That's what he's going to do. Sometimes we think, well, man, I've been a Christian for so long now, I really should have my act together. But the truth is, is that when we put our faith in Christ, what we're committing ourselves to is him constantly putting our act together for the rest of our lives. And there will be some progress, but it'll be continual and ongoing. I I like the example of if you've ever put tile down in in your house, you know, that you go and you you lay all of the tile, you have it all laid out. And in between each tile, there are these seams, there are the gaps, and you put the grout in between the seams. And you, you mix up the grout and you don't want it to be too thin, but you don't want it to be too thick. You want it to be thick enough that it's going to be solid, but thin enough that you can spread it through all of the cracks into all of the crevices between the tile. And when God comes into our lives, that's what he does. He begins to move his gospel, his grace, his love into all of the gaps in our hearts, into all of the broken places in our lives. And he's constantly pushing the gospel deeper and deeper into our lives, pushing the gospel deeper and deeper into our brokenness, pushing the gospel deeper and deeper into areas of our life that need to come into subjection to him. And so we're not perfect. God is working on us. 
And this lack of perfection is obvious in verses 33 and 34. He answered them, they answered him, and they said, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? The Jews that hear this, they kind of take offense at Jesus calling them servants or telling them that they need to be freed. And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And what he says to them here is that if you are practicing sin, you're a slave to sin. You're a servant to sin. Now, he doesn't say that if you ever mess up that you're a slave to sin. But rather, if you commit sin on this ongoing basis. And I love the way that the English Standard Version translates this because it says whoever practices sin. Because it's this ongoing practice in our lives. And if there's not this coming under the subjection of Jesus and His gospel and His work in our lives, then it's a sign that we're not in service to Him, but rather we're in service to sin. So Jesus says here in verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. He's saying, you'll be my disciples. And as you are my disciples, you'll come to know more and more of the truth. And this truth will make you free. When the gospel comes into our broken, jagged, uneven, hole ridden heart, it begins to work into every aspect Even after we have the ultimate freedom from our sin, there are areas of our life that he wants to bring greater and greater freedom. And and this is beautiful, okay? The Lord is so committed to our freedom from sin. He's so committed in us becoming more like him that even in the disasters of our life, he is working to bring about more freedom. It's for that reason that God says in his word, that he works all things together for the good of them that love him. Now, it doesn't say that all things are good, but rather that God will use all things for good. That he'll use the, the messiness, and he'll use the catastrophes, and he'll use the heartaches to bring good in in those moments. And when it feels like our world is completely falling apart, God is constantly looking for a moment, for a place, for a truth that he can insert. And he's going to take this bad situation and use it for good. Imagine that your life is like a house and a tornado comes through and wrecks the house. And you're standing there in front of your house and it's just completely destroyed. And you think... This is horrible. It's it's just all gone. But your wife says, we're going to build the kitchen back bigger. And I'm going to finally get that walk-in closet that I've wanted, right? She's looking for the opportunities to to expand. Thomas Edison, his laboratories burned, and he was walking through the ashes of his laboratories. And his colleagues were saying, I can't believe we lost it. He said, this is great because we'll build it back better. And we'll have an opportunity to start fresh. And when there's this brokenness and this messiness in our lives, it is painful and there is loss and there is grief. But God steps in and he says, even in this, I'm going to bring about good. I'm going to make you more like myself. I'm going to bring about some redemption here. I'm going to bring about grace and love here. And for those of you who have walked through those dark moments, you've experienced those difficult passages in this life's journey, you know that those were times that God often stepped in and brought about the most significant change in your life. Because in those moments, you came to know the truth, and the truth set you free. The Jews in this chapter, they get offended with Jesus because they had been trusting in their ethnicity. And they're actually people who criticize the veracity of the Bible. They, they want to say that, that, that people have altered the Scriptures. And this, John chapter 8, is one of the chapters that they criticize. Because Jesus' words against the Jews, if you continue to read through chapter 8, are so strong that there are people who say that someone got a hold of this and they have changed it to be anti-Semitic, to be against the Jews. Someone who hated the Jews has rewritten Jesus' words to be so strong against them. But what Jesus is doing here is he's not attacking their Jewishness. They feel that he is. He says, you are servants to sin. That isn't about them being Jews, but they feel threatened because they've always put their hope and their faith in their Jewishness. Oftentimes, we get offended when Jesus comes at our pet sins and our pet causes. 
can, can I just, can I level with you? The Holy Spirit is not picking on you. God is not picking on you. He's calling out your sin, and maybe it kind of feels like he's picking on you. I mean, just this past week, so, so one of you who invited a friend to join us, after service, the friend said, did you tell him all about what's going on with me? Because it felt like I must kind of know their story. And I didn't. And Jesus isn't picking on the fact that they're Jews here. He's picking on their sin. It's not a Jewish problem. It's a human problem. And because sin is a human problem, it feels like it's directed at each one of us specifically. But it's the problem that we all have. And if I sat down in my office and I started reading and I said, hmm, what is a way that I can really ring Ben's bell this week? I'm going to make him feel really guilty, right? <laughs> that would flop. It would fail. Ben would probably miss that Sunday, you know? And the rest of you would be like, man, Ben should have heard that. He should have been here. <laughs> but if we just stick to the Scripture, and we talk on the issue of sin, it touches all of us, wherever we're at. And what Jesus is doing here is he's telling him, you are servants to sin. You're slaves to sin. Your problem is sin. And that affects everyone, Jew or Greek. It touches all of us. But when Jesus begins to push back on their sin, they feel offended and they begin to protect the God that they've trusted in, the fact that they're Jews. You see, for these people, they always thought that they were good to go with God because they were born Jewish. That's what they had trusted in. And it may be that the thing that you trust in is your comfort or your family tree or your works, the things that you've done, how kind you have been or generous you have been or how faithful you have been to church. And if I push against your sin, you feel like I'm belittling that. I'm not trying to belittle that. I'm just trying to point out that we all still have this problem called sin. And it must be dealt with. See, what Jesus longs to do is he longs to come and take the throne of our hearts. And when Jesus takes the throne, freedom rolls down throughout the kingdom. Now, imagine that your, your life is, is a kingdom, a small kingdom in the Middle Ages, and a new king takes the throne. Now, immediately in the castle, there would be this immediate effect of a new king being in charge, sitting on the throne. The servants who are within earshot are going to start immediately honoring, obeying, serving that king. But out in the hamlets and in the villages and in the outposts, there would be places where they don't even know that there's a new king yet. They don't even know that the king died. They don't even know that his son has taken his throne. They don't even know yet. But eventually that news is going to travel to them. And they will either then give their allegiance to the new king or they will rebel. And what happens in our lives is that Jesus takes the throne of our hearts. And there's this immediate allegiance to Christ here in our hearts, but then it begins to flow outward into the, all the aspects of our lives, into our relationships, into our parenting, into our finances, into our marriage and our friendships the way we relate to our parents. And in every one of those places, there's opportunities for allegiance and submission or rebellion. And what has happened here is that as the truth of the gospel and the truth of Jesus as the Son of God comes into the lives of these Jews, it comes up against the place in their hearts where they have taken great nationalistic pride. We are okay because we are Jews. We were descendants of Abraham. It doesn't matter what else happens. We've always got that. And instead of submitting that to Jesus, they rebel against it and they push against it. And in that moment, they feel like they're pushing against it so that they can hold on to their freedom. But instead, they're just showing how clearly they are in servitude to that pride and arrogance. And when Jesus pushes against some sin or some arrogance or some pride in our hearts and lives and we push against it, we say, but I, I want to be free to do what I want to do. 
I, I want to be able to do what I want to do. I, I don't want you to tell me what to do in this area of my life, Jesus. When we feel like that we're standing up for our freedom, and really all we're doing is we're demonstrating our servitude to something that is not worthy of our allegiance, not worthy of our giving ourselves to. Jesus points out to them that they are not free because they are bound to their sin. He says, you claim to be sons of Abraham, but you live in sin. So much so that when I offend you, you threaten to kill me. He says, you sound less like sons of Abraham and more like sons of the devil. And then they're really offended. And if you read the end of this chapter, the people are actually picking up stones because now they're going to throw throw stones at Jesus. They're going to stone Jesus. A mob mentality takes over again. They have a profound misunderstanding about their freedom. And we, we do today as well. Most people look at this book as a hindrance to their freedom. Most people look at the commands in the Bible as something that wants to ruin their good time. Many people look at God's Word as this archaic book that needs to be thrown out so that we can have the freedom that we we could have without it. We'd finally be able to do what it is that we want. But there is no freedom without truth. I love John Piper's illustration of this principle. He said, most people would agree that one of the most free-feeling experiences can be free-falling or skydiving, right? I mean, you're jumping out of a plane. There's nothing holding you. You're just flying through the air. Probably a very freeing experience. You feel like, boy, this is living. But you know that before you can go skydiving... You have to take a class because you've got to know how to operate the parachute. And you have to show up at the airport at a specific time so that you can catch the plane. And then when you jump out of the plane, you have to follow all these procedures. Now, imagine if you wanted to go skydiving, the guy said, okay, great. Tomorrow, be here at 8 a.m. We're going to do the class. And then on Saturday at 9, the plane will take off. And you say, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm doing this because I enjoy freedom and appointments and classes and rules and regulations It's not really my style. Well, if if you're going to jump out of the airplane, you got to know what you're doing. You got to you got to take the class, and you have to be here on time. I don't want to do that. But imagine if you had managed to get yourself on the airplane without taking the class, managed to just happen to show up at the right time to to get on the plane, managed to get on the plane and not listen to any of their instructions and refuse their parachute, and you jump out of the plane. And that's not free-falling. That's just falling. And while you might feel completely uninhibited by anyone's rules or regulations, and you're not weighed down by their big, heavy backpack that they wanted you to wear, you're just free to do what you want to do and go where you want to go when you want to go. In that moment, you would not be free. You would very much be a slave to the law of gravity. And it would be your destruction. And in a world where we throw off all rules, in a world where we throw off all things that make us feel guilt or condemnation, where we say, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't like anybody telling me when or why or how. It might feel free, but it's really just falling. And it ends in destruction. So where is freedom? Well, Jesus told us. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free indeed. That's real freedom. When we know the truth, that Christ came to take the penalty and punishment for our sin. Christ came, the Son of God, to live as one of us. Not to give us commands that He is completely unrelated to, but rather to come and live as one of us, to live a life free from sin, to experience the difficulty and the challenges and the adversities, the pain and the weariness of this life. 
and then to lay his life down so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be free from condemnation and guilt and the punishment we deserve from breaking those rules. And that when we come to him and we come to know his truth, he works into every aspect of our lives to bring us greater and greater freedom. That when he takes the throne of our hearts, freedom rolls down into every aspect of our lives. But we have to be willing to accept him as king. We have to be willing to believe that we are who he says we are. And that's hard. Because we all have this picture in our minds of who we are. For the Jews, it was, we're God's chosen people. Because we're God's chosen people, we have nothing to worry about. But then Jesus calls them slaves to sin. For us today, it's, I'm a good person. I don't take from other people. I I try to help other people out. I do what I'm supposed to. I'm a good person. Jesus says we are slaves to sin until we come to know the truth and the truth makes us free 